Be attentive. Wisdom is proclaimed in the second letter of St. Peter, Apostle. His divine power has bestowed on us everything that makes for life and devotion through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and power. Through these, he has bestowed on us the precious and very great promises so that through them you may come to share in the divine nature after escaping from the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with devotion, devotion with mutual affection, mutual affection with love. Heavenly Father, you loved us so much that you did not only want to share with us the good things of this creation, nor simply the good things that you have shared with the angels. You loved us so much that you wanted to share with us your very self. And so in sanctifying grace, you let us share in your life and live that life as our own. At the end of time, your joy will be our joy. Your glory will be our glory. You will share all these things with us, not because you need us, but simply out of your love for us. But Father, we are so petty. We love the little things of this world which are passing away more than we love you. We consider the little honors of this world as more worthy than the honor of being your son or your daughter. This Lent, wake us up. Help us to see and to understand what you have done for us in Jesus Christ. And let us embrace it with all of our heart, putting our hope not in this world or this life, but in that life you will share with us forever in glory. It is because all good comes to us from you. It is because of your splagnitsomai that you love us right here and now with an urgent love, that you alone deserve the name Father. And so we dare to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. This morning, we return to the primary question, how do we concretely cooperate with grace? Remember, cooperation with grace is the very essence of Catholic life and practice. To effectively serve God and neighbor, we need to cooperate with grace. To repent of our sins and obtain God's forgiveness, we need to cooperate with grace. To grow in holiness, we need to cooperate with God's grace. The Catechism of the Catholic Church definitively teaches that all our good and salvation is dependent upon our cooperation with grace. The Catechism says, quote, the preparation of man for the reception of grace is already a work of grace. This latter is needed to rouse and sustain our collaboration in justification through faith, and in sanctification through charity. God brings to completion in us what he has begun. The Catechism is simply saying it's all grace. It begins with grace, it ends with grace, and the middle is all grace. 
The Catechism then quotes St. Augustine, quote, since he who completes his work by cooperating with our will began by working so that we might will it, end of quote. Even our will for those things which are good is simply a matter of grace. Unless I had received grace, I could not will the good. How are we to understand this riddle of grace, that grace itself is possible only by grace? It is a riddle. It is a mystery. And yet we get little glimpses of it in this world. Let me see if I can give you a little taste. It begins with grace, ends with grace. It's all grace. One time when I was in Indonesia, I was watching a fisherman. He had one of these single little boats, and it had one sail. And he was having a hard time unfurling the sail. I knew he couldn't shimmy up the, as it were, uh, main mast to unfurl it. So I was wondering how in the devil he was going to get this sail unfurled, because unless it was unfurled, he wasn't going to be able to take his boat and his catch back to port. But then he did something that surprised me. He just walked to the back of his little boat, holding the sail out, and suddenly the wind came up, and the wind unfurled his whole sail. And then the wind, as it were, moved the sail and the boat to the port. So the whole thing was done by what? The wind. The wind was the beginning, the wind was the end, and the wind was the middle. It was all wind. Maybe that's a little taste for us to understand that our life as Catholic Christians is all about grace. And that all about grace means that I have to cooperate with it. St. Paul, writing to the Philippians, boldly affirms that God, not our own willfulness, is at work in us as we attain holiness and salvation. So even our free will cooperation with grace is itself grace. St. Paul says, quote, for God is the one who, for his good purpose, works in you both to desire and to work, end of quote. Your very desire for salvation is God's grace active in you. The Catechism of the Catholic Church in Article 308 reminds us that our every act of intellect and will is possible only because God empowers it and sustains it. You know, sometimes we think we live independent lives. God's out there, I'm here. That's a lie. Unless God was active in me at this very moment, I couldn't speak a word. Unless God was active in me right now, I couldn't think a thought. Unless God himself was active in me, in my human nature right now, not only sustaining it, but empowering it and bringing it to act, I couldn't see a single color. I couldn't be aware. That's the first level at which God acts in us. So to say that we can will something freely without God is insane. I can't will at all except God acts that I will. And more than that, God acts in a second, as it were, level. That's the level we call grace, because we're going to act above what is possible for our human nature. So when I will salvation, I'm willing something above what I as a mere human being can attain. I can only do that because God now acts in that realm of grace. He gives me the power to do what is beyond my human nature. But it's still God acting in me. And so both in our nature and then in grace, God is the one acting. So to cause some kind of division between me and God, to put him out there and I'm here, that's a terrible mistake. It's all God. What I need to do is to begin to cooperate with what God is doing. If I cooperate with what he is doing, then he's going to bring me to that supernatural end, which is my salvation. And so the Catechism says, 
far from diminishing the creature's dignity, this truth enhances it. Drawn from nothingness by God's power, wisdom, and goodness, it can do nothing if it is caught off from its origin, for without a creator, the creature vanishes. In other words, it is God's act in me. The next time you see someone that looks like they're about to burst into tears and you walk over and you put your arm around them and you comfort them, suddenly be very much aware that this isn't you. It's God. It's God sharing with you, in you, and through you his concern for the other person. Now you can truly say, Jesus and I are doing this together. That's cooperation with grace. When someone insults you and you keep your mouth shut, that's not simply your willfulness. That's Jesus and you keeping your mouth shut, and you and Jesus are keeping your mouth shut. But that's God's black nitsomai alive and well in you at that moment, allowing you to be an instrument of his mercy and peace. For if you'd open your mouth, it wouldn't be mercy and peace. We need grace if we would be fully human because of the ruin of original sin, and even more if we are to attain our true and eternal end. But to obtain that grace, we must be prepared and determined to cooperate with it. So we have the concrete question, how do I cooperate with grace? If we were to set one goal for ourselves during Lent, it would be that. How can I increase or intensify my cooperation with grace all day long? That's the aim of every Christian. If I could, I would be a living saint. That's what John Paul II was doing every single day, and I knew John Paul II. He was striving always to cooperate with grace, and you could almost hear him muttering under his voice, what is the grace, what is the grace? What he was saying is, what is the grace God is offering me at this moment? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could ask that question? What is the grace? But before we can speak about cooperating with grace, we must first understand a little bit of what it is. Maybe the best way to proceed is to establish what grace is not. First of all, grace is not God acting to make life easier for us, or helping us to do what we could do on our own, or even what we could not do on our own. Surprisingly, grace is not God's assistance enabling us to live a good life. It just simply isn't. Rather, grace is the intimacy of existing in God's love and concern for us here and now. Grace is but to participate in the most full and complete way in God's black nitsomai for us. That's grace. Grace is to live God's life as your own. That's sanctifying grace. It's nothing less. It's not somehow God coming to your assistance here or now. It basically is God inviting you to live his life full time, to be transfigured and changed. To enable that, he gives you actual graces, but actual graces are always related, either internal or external, to sanctifying grace. Let me give you another image, an effect of this sanctifying grace. You know, no matter how much we might love another person in this world, we all have to face what I call the barrier of skin. No matter how much I might love someone, I cannot breach the barrier of skin so that I can feel what they feel, think their thoughts, and know their inner life with its fears and joys. They can tell me about it. I can try to sympathize with it but I can't get through the skin. All the science of this world can't breach the barrier of skin. But God, who created and sustains us body and soul, knows intimately our inner life, feelings, and thoughts. 
And through the sacred humanity of Jesus, which is one with our human nature, God then can express to us his intimacy with us in human terms that we can grasp and experience. I can honestly say Jesus feels my pain. Jesus understands my disappointment and my sorrow and my confusion. He can penetrate the barrier of skin. And if two people truly love Jesus with all of their hearts, then that same Jesus who penetrates the barrier of each one of their skins can unite them in a spiritual way that overcomes that barrier of skin even in this life. But it requires that both of them are united to who? To Jesus. Grace? Grace is to live the life of God as our own, and if I begin to live that life, I can begin to, as it were, open up for the lives of everyone else I love. It's impossible for science, it's impossible for anything in this world, but it's what grace is all about. It's to love people not from afar, but to love them up close and intimately because, in a sense, through Jesus, we begin to share in their life. That's why we call each other in Christianity brothers and sisters. We are, in fact, living the same life. Let me give you another example of grace. A grace that breaks down the barriers between us and God in the most profound ways. While I was teaching in Rome, I got to know a very wonderful Italian family who had a very precocious little daughter. When the time for her first Holy Communion was approaching, she wanted me to celebrate her first Communion Mass and to give her her first Holy Communion. She'd even gone to her pastor and gotten permission and everything else. Now, I have a little bit of dyslexia. I can't always tell right from left, and I switch syllables in foreign languages, so I didn't want to embarrass her, and I said, no. You know, if I try to celebrate your Mass in Italian, it's going to really turn out to be a laughing thing. So, oh, but she was very stubborn. She demanded I do it, so I finally did it, and apparently I didn't do too badly. And after the Mass, we went back to her house for a celebration. Now, the Italians really know how to celebrate. It began about 10 o'clock in the morning, and it lasted to 10 o'clock in the evening. And you did nothing but sit down, eat, talk, and drink. 12 hours. You also learned not to eat much because something better was coming. And you didn't drink much because something better was coming. But there was only one fly in the ointment, and that was this little girl's maternal grandfather. He was one of the meanest, miserable men I have ever met. He was anti-Catholic, and he was anti-clerical. And he began this celebration by making fun of his granddaughter's first Holy Communion, which I thought was in terribly bad taste. He brought some of his confreres with him, and they would sit and make jokes about it, and they would die laughing. At one point, I was so upset, I was going to get up and confront the old man. The little girl's mother came by, put her hand on my shoulder, pushed me down, whispered in my ear that her daughter could take care of her grandfather. Well, later on, he began joking again about it and asked her what she experienced when she received her first Holy Communion. Did she see a bunch of little angels come down like a flock of little birds? And somehow he thought that was funny, and they all started laughing again. At that, the little girl stood up and very loudly now said, No. He looked at her and then and said, well, then what happened? And she looked at him and she said, Jesus kissed me. And he said, how could Jesus kiss you? And she said, well, when someone touches your lips, it's a kiss. And when I received Holy Communion, Jesus touched my lips. So Jesus kissed me. Now, I have never thought of Holy Communion as Jesus actually kissing and claiming us as his own. But I do believe with all of my heart, mind, and soul that after the words of consecration, there is no longer bread or wine there. It is truly the humanity and divinity of Jesus that when the host touches our lips, who is actually touching us? Jesus. 
and he kisses us. He kisses us, as she said to her grandfather, in front of everyone. He's not ashamed of us. The only shame in Holy Communion is we're ashamed of Jesus. And he embraces us with love. And because he's divine and we receive Holy Communion, that very kiss goes right on through our skin, through our very being, to the heart of our soul. And there he indwells us as Lord and Savior. That's grace. Grace is to share in the divine nature, even as St. Peter says in that reading I proclaimed at the beginning. Grace is God's blagnitzomai actualized in our lives and experience. Grace is being loved and loving in God himself who is love. On the other hand, some might misunderstand grace is God doing for us what we ought to have done for ourselves or even what we could not do for ourselves. Cooperation with grace is then understood as being passive before God's activity in us and for us. Other words, I just sit and do nothing and God does it all. But as St. Augustine, the doctor of grace, so firmly and definitively teaches, grace is not a matter of God doing something for us while we remain passive. Grace itself is a union, a sharing, a unified acting together of God and ourselves. So I might believe in grace, I might come in church, I can just sit there and wait for it all to happen, but nothing's going to happen, because that's not the nature of grace. God doesn't want to dominate. God wants children. God wants friends. He wants our cooperation. Without it, Nothing happens. Let me give you another image of cooperating with grace. When I was in junior high school, my mother forced me to go to a school for ballroom dancing. Oh, it was horrible. I was sure my mother hated me. I couldn't figure out what I had done wrong to deserve this punishment. The little girl assigned to me kept kicking me and stepping on my toes. I found out later she couldn't hear well, so she couldn't hear the beat, but that's beyond the point. Anyhow, my mother wouldn't let up. I had to learn how to dance the foxtrot and the waltz and the samba and the tango and all the rest of them. Ah, uh, but then when I went to high school, it actually all paid off. There was a wonderful girl there called Crystal Olson. Oh, she was wonderful. Oh, she was the most beautiful thing you ever saw. And Crystal loved ballroom dancing. The people who took her out, though, was mostly the football team. But the football team, almost no one knew how to dance. They just stood and did their little thing. And so I would go to every dance. And after the first dance, uh, she would leave the football player. And then Crystal and I would dance for the rest of the evening. Now, if you're dancing ballroom dancing, you will notice that one person doesn't dance and the other sit there and do nothing. Isn't that true? You both have to cooperate. It's a shared event. Cooperation with grace is grace. Grace is, by definition, a shared event. It's shared between me and God. It is true that God leads. It is true that God does 99.999999% of the doing. But that still leaves us the 0.000001% to do. We have to cooperate in the dance. If one moves forward, the other moves back. If one moves to the right, the other moves to the left. And yet this cooperation between the two dancers is so perfect that it seems if you watch someone who really knows how to ballroom dance with their partner, it's almost as if there's only one person there, one act. That's a symbol of grace. God dances with us. Our whole life is caught up with this constant interaction with God. This is what we're struggling for. Of course, if someone doesn't cooperate, then the dance looks almost like a fight going on. And that's what most of our Catholic lives look like. And so we're trying to learn how to dance with God, how to cooperate with him. 
Grace only exists in relation to ourselves. St. Augustine had a wonderful way of putting it. He said, quote, God will not save us without us. Grace is our participation in the divine nature who is love itself. So what is grace? Well, first we have to grasp the truth that it is something that we have no right to. I can't force God to give me grace. There's nothing I can do to earn grace. Grace is God's free gift. It's part of his plagnizo mai. He really, really loves us. He offers us grace. Ah, but it doesn't become complete, perfect, until I cooperate with it. So I have to learn to discern grace, and I still have a responsibility of saying yes to God and in cooperating with it. Grace is a free and undeserved gift of God's love. We cannot earn it. We can only accept or refuse it when it is offered to us. Grace understood in its fullness is then the gift itself, as distinguished from the promise of the gift. The Old Testament promises us salvation, but that salvation is only actualized and realized in Jesus. The true full gift is Jesus. Jesus himself is the fullness of grace, and the Holy Spirit who was sent by Jesus is all grace fulfilled and made perfect. So grace is the actuality of the gift given, possessed in some way, here and now. It's not finished. It's not complete yet. That won't happen until our death. But it is being given now. Let me give you another image. My father was born with three separate heart conditions. Any one of the three could kill him. I remember as being a young teen, taking him to see the surgeon, who told him very bluntly that they could not perform surgery. Why? Because in trying to repair one of the defects, the other two would kill him. So the science of surgery at that time hadn't progressed enough to deal with his situation. Many years later, after I was ordained a priest, I saw my father sitting on the steps of the back porch, huffing and puffing as if he'd run a long, long race, and all he was trying to do was tie his shoe. I knew that it was time. He was going to die. I called my mother. We got him in the car and got him to the emergency room. About an hour later, the surgeon surprised me. I didn't even know he was there, came out and told us that my father had been taken into emergency surgery. Well, I had a heart attack. If you do surgery, he's going to die. You try to correct one of them, you told us the other two would kill him. Uh, but the surgeon said, we've improved since then. I think we can deal with all three at the same time and possibly save your father's life. We need you to sign the document. And so I signed it. Well, during the surgery, what had been promised was coming into actuality. That's where we are now. What has been promised is now being made actual in our lives. It won't be finished until the end, but it's occurring right now. It's happening right now, and we want to be part of it. The good news is that the surgery was successful. It dealt with and corrected all three of his heart conditions. One of them was a replacement of a valve, and I remember listening to a stethoscope to that valve click. What a wonderful sound that was. Grace is the promise being fulfilled now in Jesus Christ. Thus, our concept of grace must have the following notions. Grace is a gift which indicates, manifests the favor and love of God for us. Two, it is a gift we desperately need, even as my father needed that surgery. Three, there is no way we can obtain that gift by our own efforts. There's no way my father could have saved his own life or all those who loved him could have done anything to save him. Four, we are positively unworthy of the gift. 
That's the hardest for us to swallow. We have to be humble. We have forfeited the gift by our deliberate refusal of God's will in our lives by our sins. Five, we are able to accept this gift only by an act of cooperation with the very giving of the gift. Cooperation. God offers it. He doesn't force it. Again, remember the principle of St. Augustine. God will not save us without us. He won't do it for us without us. Grace is an actuality in the person who receives it as a new way of existing due to an action of the Holy Spirit. My father had a whole new way of existing after the surgery. Grace changes us. It makes us new creations. We aren't the same. It's hard for us to understand that. We become, as it were, raised up into a supernatural way of being. It would be like someone born blind and surgery could restore their sight. After they started seeing, they wouldn't be the same people. They would have powers they never had before. They would be radically changed. Grace changes us into new beings. That's why scripture says new creation. And this actuality of sanctifying grace is permanent. Let me give you the image. <laughs> We've all gone through a permanent change. Usually it's a little bit confusing and uh, sometimes even a little bit uh, anxious ridden. It's called puberty. Remember that? I remember the first time my voice broke. I sang in the Baptist choir, a nice high voice. Right in the middle of the Sunday service, it broke. Total embarrassment. I had no idea what was going on. Ran away from the crier in tears. My father patiently trying to explain to me what was happening within me. I remember my sister coming home from school crying. She had cut herself and she was bleeding. She wasn't bleeding. She was having her first menstrual period. Oh, these were a little bit traumatic events but they signaled a radical change in our lives. We were no longer juveniles, we were becoming what? Adults. Well, grace does that to you. And sometimes we have that same kind of traumatic experience. We aren't going to be the same again. We're going to be changed. And it's a permanent radical change. Grace makes us a new creation. We couldn't dance with God before, now we can begin to learn to dance. And there's no limit to learning to dance. The Catechism of the Catholic Church in Article 1996, sounds like yesterday, speaks of grace as a gift in which we become God's children, sharing the divine nature itself. That's the whole point. We share in God's life as our own. That's grace. The Catechism says, quote, Grace is favor, the free and undeserved help that God gives us to respond to his call to become children of God, adoptive sons, partakers of the divine nature and, an, and of eternal life. For a moment, we might stop and consider that as witnesses to God's grace, we are also to become acts of grace for others so as to invite and attract them to share our faith and hope in Jesus. As God's life lives in me, then I can use my own life, as it were, as an act of grace for other people. I can do good things for people who are mean to me. I can do unexpected good things, which you don't deserve. But since I do them for you, I'm offering you a chance to what? To respond. And so we can become, as it were, acts of grace for those around us. That's what evangelization is all about. Thus, our witness of love and compassion must be free and a gift, grace acting through us for the good of the other. 
Grace is then a divine intimacy of love and life that we share with, in, and through Jesus. Grace is basically splagnizomai, God's love lived as our own lives. So the Catechism of the Catholic Church in Article 1977 says, Grace is a participation in the life of God. It introduces us into the intimacy of Trinitarian life. What is important for us to grasp is that grace is love. And that is not something we share with God at a distance, but a reality that takes us into itself, perfects us and raises us to a divine level while respecting our creatureliness and humanity. Because God is love, he does not love us from afar, but up close and intimate. And this means that grace is union with God. To cooperate with grace means to let God get to me. Break the barrier of skin. Get inside. Be part of who I am. We may not be able to experience grace, divine love directly, but we can experience its effects in our lives. And that requires faith. Let me leave you with one last image. While I was in the United States Navy, I was having these feelings that God might be calling me to a vocation. Now, I'm a convert. I'd only been in the Catholic Church about two and a half years. I was also engaged to be married. By the way, I just escaped marriage by about that much. I was actually engaged twice. I didn't like the feeling. If you have a vocation and you become a priest, you can't get married. And I had my heart set on getting married. The Navy had made me an almost impossible offer. My family couldn't afford to send me to medical school, but the Navy offered that if I would agree, in a sense, to accept a commission as an officer, they would send me to medical school and pay for the whole thing. Then I owed them seven years after graduation. I mean, that's not bad. Think about it. After I finished the Navy, I could retire with a commission, set up my own personal practice. I could be a happy, fat old doctor. And by the way, doctors are wonderful when you're sick. I love doctors. You know, I could have afforded to get married as soon as I got my commission. So I tried to get rid of this whole notion of being a priest. I began writing off to religious orders for their vocational material. Now, this is just at the end of Vatican II, so nothing has really changed. I remember the Passionists sending me their vocational material, and it was horrible. It sounded like committing yourself to a prison with a torture chamber for the rest of your life. I read it, and the more I read it, the better I felt not having a vocation. So then I wrote off to the Jesuits, and they were just as bad, and I wrote to the Franciscans, they weren't much better. And I was having a lot of fun. I was actually making a collection of vocational material. I made a mistake of writing to the Dominicans. Father Dooley, who was the vocational director at the time, was a little addle-brained. Apparently, he had received a letter from another young man asking for an application. He got us confused, and so he sent me the application, and he sent the other man uh, vocational material. Now, I don't know what happened to him, but I know when I got my letter and opened it, waiting for my vocation material, there was the application, and I had a heart attack. Was this a sign from God? Remember, interpret it by faith. And I was so disturbed that it might be a sign from God that I actually filled the stupid thing out. Got a doctor's exam. And then at the last minute, I really got cold feet. So I put it back in the envelope. It was already stamped. I took it to, I was on leave from the Navy and visiting my parents to the local Catholic church in Aiken, South Carolina, St. Mary's Help of Christians. And after Mass, I went over and put it on Our Lady's altar and told her that if it was there five 
I mean, next Sunday, seven days later, I would mail it. If it wasn't, it was a sign from heaven that God didn't want me to be a priest. Now, I was cheating because Monsignor Smith at the time hated people putting pieces of paper on Our Lady's altar, and after every Mass, he used to come out. He'd take off the chasuble, but leave everything else on with the brown paper bag and sweep everything off the altar into it, shake it at the people to find them to put more little notes on the altar and then go back in. So I was quite sure that he would come out and, as it were, there went my letter and now I'm safe. I have no idea what happened. Next Sunday I went to Mass, went to Our Lady's altar after Mass, and there only one thing was on that altar, that letter, and here am I. You know, grace is for real. Grace works in sometimes almost miraculous ways. My suspicion now is that one of the sisters who used to sit on that side kind of overheard my prayer, came up, took the letter home, kept it for seven days, brought it back the next Sunday. I have no idea what happened. What I do know is I'm more grateful for that than anything else. I value my vocation more than anything else. I would never trade anything for it. Grace? Grace has more treasures, more goodness, more power, more reality than anything we can imagine. And there's only one thing that stands between us and the fullness of grace, and that's our willingness to cooperate with it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.